Hold on just a second here. Okay, so for harmonic motion, we are going to look at something that um, repeats its motion over and over again, right? So this is kind of a subset of, um, if, if you guys have done like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum with anything that repeats over and over, this is going to be just another way of looking at this. Um, kind of like last week, our ballistic lab, our ballistic pendulum lab was really just a combination of concepts, right? In that case, we did conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Um, today's lab is going to be uh, looking at equilibrium and harmonic motion to determine some unknown state of our system, right? So here I have a picture of kind of what we're going to be using for our lab today, which is a mass attached to a vertical spring. So what happens is this mass kind of goes up and down, so all of its motion is in the y direction, right? Um, and so there are two parts to this. One is the energy that it has, right? When it's moving up and down, right? Um, it's always sort of oscillating between how much kinetic energy it has and how much spring potential energy it has and gravitational potential energy. So there's that. Um, but other than that, there's going to be, so it seems like there's a lot of parts involved, but we're going to take two approaches to look at what is going on here, right? But before we do that, I want to just really quickly review with you guys oscillation. So remember we had um, centripetal motion. We had a, something that um, makes some circular path over and over again, right? So in this case here, I've drawn kind of, let's say, the Earth and the Moon, right? And the Moon is going to go around the Earth, and it's going to keep doing this continuously, right? So... One thing here, just to kind of tie together a few concepts, is this concept of a wave or oscillating motion, right? What? So, in the y direction, if I kind of look at the motion of the moon on this circular path only in the y direction, so I'm starting at zero, right? starts on this line for the y-axis and it's going to go away from the y-axis in the positive direction and then it's going to come back to zero and then it's going to go in the negative direction it's going to come back to zero right so if i have four points here like these four points for the motion of the moon and I'm just going to record those four points with these kind of here as like one, two, three, four, right? I'm going to do this later for X, so I'm going to mark it here, one, two, three, four, okay? And I'm just going to track where the moon is at these points, right? So here at 12 o'clock, right, um, the moon is, I will say, at the, some maximum away from the Y-axis in the positive direction. And then goes back to zero, and then negative, and then back to zero, right? So if I kind of plot out what this is, I start at zero, I go to some maximum positive, and then back to zero again, some maximum negative, and then back to zero again, right? And if I connect this, it's actually just a smooth line. This is a wave, right? So it should look something like this. And Similarly, in the x direction, right, this is also, because it's happening over and over again, this is also an oscillation. This is also an oscillatory motion, except in the x direction, I actually, here, I don't start at the zero of the x. I start kind of uh, over here in the positive, just say to the right is positive, to the left is negative, okay? So to the right of my x-axis over here, I start at the beginning, so I'm at this maximum, and then I'll start going towards zero, negative towards zero, back towards positive, right? So if I plot that out, starting at this positive maximum, then I'll go towards zero, and then here at nine o'clock, I'll go to the negative maximum here, and then here at six o'clock, I will go 
back to zero and then back to this positive. Even though they look a little bit different, the shape is actually the same. You might, you guys might just recognize this as um, one being sine and one being cosine, right? But these are both wave motions, right? So actually today's a little bit easier because we don't have to consider two dimensional oscillation. It's only one dimension. So here we only have the y direction. Okay, but what is actually providing the force that we need, this continual force? In centripetal motion, we had this continual central force that was helping us to continue this motion, right? Because we had to continually accelerate, right? So in this case, it was gravity that was always pulling the moon in from any point, and that's what's keeping it rotating in this circular path. Today, we do have some constant set of forces, some constant net force that are playing against each other in order to create oscillations. And that's going to be, one is the force from our spring. Okay, you know what, um, I kind of have it down here, so I'll just highlight it for right now. One is the force that our, of our spring that's always trying to pull kind of back up. And then the other one is the force of weight of our mass, which is trying to pull us down, right? So one thing that we're going to use a lot today is our restorative string, spring force, right? So this is a very simple formula here. I've written here at the bottom. Our spring force is negative K times displacement. This delta Y is displacement. I've written it as delta Y. You might have seen this before as delta X, okay? So what we need is we need to um, make sure we know how to use this formula. And what it means. So remember that every spring has some equilibrium length. It has some natural shape. And the spring's entire goal in life is to keep that natural shape. It doesn't want to change. It doesn't want to stretch. It doesn't want to compress. It wants to just stay at its normal relaxed shape. So let's say this is its relaxed length right here where our mass is kind of in the middle of this dotted line. If I push it to the left, okay. So I compress the spring. I'm going to push to the left. Okay, the restoring force of the spring is restoring. It's trying to restore that shape. So it's always against me, right? So it's forces to the right. If I push to the left, it pushes to the right to get back here. If I pull it, right, to stretch this spring out, if I pull it to the right, it will pull back to the left. Okay. So because of this, because of this opposite nature, it's always against whatever I'm doing. If I pull to the right, it pulls to the left. If I push to the left, it pushes to the right. Okay. So because of that, we have here this negative. So this is always, oops. Similar to when we outlined the friction formula, uh, friction has this negative on it, and it just, we put that in there because it's always against whatever we're doing, right? So it's very similar to that in this formula. I have a negative here because whatever my displacement is, my displacement, let's say this is my zero, this dotted line, my equilibrium point here is my zero. If my displacement is positive, then it'll be positive, positive times some negative. So my force will be negative, it'll go left. If my displacement is negative, let's say I, I go from this center point, I go to the left, so this is negative. This negative and this negative will cancel and it will become a positive number. So it's pushing to the right, right? So this is why it's important for you guys to kind of standardize your um, the direction of your forces. So let's say to the right is positive, to the left is negative. So that you always have an idea of, of what's going on just by looking at the signs of numbers, right? Um, so we've got that, and our displacement here is just how far, right? How far am I from the center? Not how long is this entire thing, right? So if I did this, this is not what I want, okay? What I want is just 
from the equilibrium to whatever point. This is important today because when we're going to be having some mass hanging, okay, my, di my displacement is not from the top. Okay, my displacement is starting from some central point. How far down do I go from my equilibrium? Oops, sorry about that. So we need to be aware of, of that for today, right? That's the biggest thing that um, will kind of catch students off guard in the beginning. So that's our displacement. And the last thing here, you guys remember, uh, is our spring stiffness. or spring constant. My spring constant is how thick is my spring? How stiff is this spring that I am using in here, right? So again, the higher this number, the thicker the spring. And the thicker the spring, the more force, right? So very simple for us to use. And just one more note here. Um, I can put this down here. This is Hooke's Law. So this is Hooke's Law. And my restoring spring force here. So if you have some question on your final exam that asks you about Hooke's Law, this is what it's talking about. It's just a spring. Okay, so kind of getting to what we're going to be doing today, uh, we are going to have a mass hanging on the spring. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to find out something about the, um, something unknown about this system based on the forces involved, okay? So let's say I have a spring. Uh, and then I attach a mass to it, um, what will happen is once you attach a mass, it stretches the spring down, and then it'll kind of settle at some lower point, right? So let's say in the first case here, if I draw a spring with no mass attached, okay, it was initially at this height, and then I attach some mass and then it stretches down to this new height, right? So it stretches down from this initial equilibrium down here, right? And this is because in the beginning, all we had was um, the force of weight of gravity is the only thing that's pulling this down, right? So this, if we say this has like a negligible mass, and we don't really consider any mass here, uh, sorry, any force here. Uh, but once we put this mass on, the force of weight is going to pull this down, and as it pulls it down, the restorative force of the spring tries to pull it back up. So there's a point when both of these things are equal. And equilibrium is really nice for us because that lets us um, have a zero in our formula and uh, kind of takes out one variable from the formula, which lets us find another unknown more easily. So in our case here, if we have equilibrium, right, the place where weight and spring force here are equal to each other. So my net force is equal to zero. So if I say zero is equal to my spring force plus my force of weight. Now, again, here, um, be careful about your signs here. Net force is just add up all my forces together but my forces individually can have different signs, right? So be careful with that. So here I will have, um, if I kind of plug in what I know for my spring force here, my restoring force, my Hooke's law, this is going to be negative K delta Y. And for my force of weight, this is just mass times gravity. Okay, again, I haven't artificially put any negative symbols out on in front of anything, even though I already know that my force of weight is going to be down and my restorative force is going to be up. So it kind of looks backwards here, um, but it's not because remember our displacement is going to be negative eventually. 
uh, and here my gravity is going to be a negative number. So from here, there are two things that we can, or sorry, let me go ahead and put them on either side. So here I'll have K delta Y is equal to mass times gravity. All I've done is I've taken this term to the other side of the formula. So from here, there are two ways that we can take this formula here. Let's say I know how much mass I put on that spring, but I don't know the spring stiffness. In this case, I can find the spring constant just by, in my formula here, dividing both sides by displacement. So this would be mass times gravity over displacement, just like that. The other way I can take this is, let's say I know how stiff the spring is, but I don't know how much mass I'm hanging on here. This is actually the case when you don't know how much mass is on, but you know about your spring. Uh, this is kind of what these um, like grocery uh, scales are based on, right? Is they know kind of their, uh, the spring force that is trying to equal, equal sorry, equalize them, uh, but you put some unknown mass on there, right? Like you put a bunch of ham or you put some fruit or whatever on one of these scales and they depress a little bit and they measure how much they move in order to uh, give us, if you know the displacement, then you'll be able to mass. And the way that it works is we're just going to solve for mass in this formula that we have right here. Solve divide both sides by gravity. So my mass is just equal to spring constant and times displacement over gravity, right? And so that's it. So if I know about the spring that I have in my system, which those balance, those uh, those kind of balances do, and then I know how much it is, then um, I can just use those with gravity to find how much mass I've actually put on here, right? So e either way, I can find something unknown about the system if I know the other part.